This morning's scripture comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 1. Paul writes, I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. In 1889, in the Times and Star News in Kansas City, we find the first print media in America of the phrase, it's on the house. In the Times and Stars, it went this way. The first drink Thursday was on the house in leading saloons. I want you to notice that. It wasn't just any saloons, it was the leading saloons that had the first drink on the house. Maybe that was the original Thirsty Thursday. And while this is not an apologetic on tavern theology, although I could do that, I do hope that you hear this idea of it's on the house as something that's free. It's on the house is a phrase that we use around here. A lot of times we use it when we're baptizing a child. Sometimes we talk about it when we come to the communion table, and sometimes we just wear it on our shirts on Wednesday nights. We see the kids wearing those bright red shirts. Grace, it's on the house. It's a phrase that we use around here because we believe and affirm that we serve a God that gives of love freely and abundantly. Since people have been people, there has been an economy. Whether we trade over uh, and barter over what we have versus what we need, whether we use coins in order to purchase that which we might want, since people have been people, there has been an economy. In the book of Acts in the New Testament, we talk about economy through the lens of house order. The word economy actually comes from the Greek word oikonomia, which means house order. How we order ourselves as people matters, and we see that in God's economy, grace, unmerited favor, the love of God is given freely. There is no barter system in mind. There is no transaction necessary. There is no coin being given. In God's world, grace is on the house. In God's economy, the way the house is is ordered is that the first gift, the first currency is given to each of us freely and we are called by the love of God to share that with others. A couple weeks ago, I was, um, about a month ago now, I was playing golf with a couple friends and uh, we had a specific tea time and so one of the guys got there early and and paid, and and my understanding is we were going to square up at the end, and we got done, and he looked at me and said, no, I I got it this round. It's on me. I wasn't real happy about that. I wanted to be able to pay for what I had used. It's interesting how sometimes this grace, how sometimes in life we're given gifts, and you know, we want to give something for it. We want to feel like we earned it, like we 
paid for it, but the gift of God is a free gift given that we can't earn, that we don't need to trade for. It's a gift that's given out of love and hope. Last week, uh, after Larry preached, he preached about a, from a prayer in John. I, I got intrigued by prayers that are in the Bible. Um, and and I, I hadn't thought about this in a while, and I looked at this prayer in Philippians, and it's interesting, right? So this book, Paul's writing to the, the church in Philippi. Uh, Paul is in prison. Someone who had once uh, imprisoned people for their faith is now in prison for his faith and his standing up for the faith. And while he's in prison, he does not look at that time as idle time, rather uses it to reach out and to share the love of God with friends that he had made on his missionary journeys. And he writes this letter. He says, I remember you constantly praying with joy for everyone in my heart. And he says this about midway through. He says, and my prayer for you is that your love may overflow more and more. I hope that you hear that prayer not only as a prayer from Paul, from the people in Philippi, but a prayer for you this day. It's our prayer that love within you may overflow more and more. In his book, uh, The Rebirthing of God, John Philip Newell uh, starts his book this way. He says this, the first thing that is said about humanity in the Hebrew scriptures is that we are made in the image and likeness of God. Everything else written about us in our scriptural inheritance needs to be read in light of that foundational truth that within us is the likeness of the one from whom we have come. Or, as Julian of Norwich puts it, we are made of God. We are made of the light that is in the beginning. We are made of the wisdom that fashioned the universe and the glory of its interrelatedness. We are made of the love that longs for oneness. And this is not to deny our capacity for falseness and for the ugly betrayals that tear us apart or the deep brokenness that happens in this world. It is simply to say that deeper still than any of this is our of Godness. Newell reminds us that in our essence, we are created in the image of a relational God. In our essence, we are created in the image of a God that brings together us in wholeness. In the image of God, we are created so that we can both receive and share a love, a grace that is on the house. Now, Newell also reminds us that this isn't some kind of touchy-feely thing, that life is hard. These beautiful flowers remind us of a celebration of life yesterday, for one that was taken too early. We have experienced in our own lives the, lives the loss of loved ones. We've experienced the brokenness of divorce. We've experienced the heartache of a child that's gone astray. We've experienced brokenness that we have both caused ourselves and has simply happened because at times the world is broken. And in those experiences, we also hear that there is a God that brings hope. There is a gift that is on the house. There is a grace that pervades even the darkest places. There is a love that conquers even the most difficult days. It doesn't mean they're not difficult. It simply means that we have hope. It simply means that God is present with us. 
So in the Wesleyan tradition, John Wesley talked about grace in three ways. I had the opportunity to hang out with our newcomers uh, over this past month, and one of the things that I share with every group of folks that comes through our doors and asks about Methodism is that the thing for me that we talk about that might make us a little unique is the way that John Wesley talked about grace. And if you've been Methodist for any time, you've heard somebody talk about this. But John Wesley liked to talk about grace in three ways. He talked about prevenient grace. Prevenient is a big word that means grace that's everywhere and free to all people. Prevenient grace is like the air that we breathe. It's like the wind that blows through the trees. It's like the sun that shines down on our face. Prevenient grace is a grace that is everywhere. It is the love of God that is for all people, no matter where they come from or where they've been. It's the grace of God that comes to us no matter what we've done or who we've hurt. It's the grace of God that comes to us no matter how deep the despair is. It is the grace of God that comes in moments of joy and we don't even realize what we're feeling, but we know there's something going on. That's provenient grace. It's grace that just is. It is in the world because God is in the world. Then you have justifying grace. Justifying grace for Wesley uh, could be determined or, or talked about as a moment, but it also could be talked about as a way of life. It could be talked about as a singular time in our lives, but many t- or many times over and over. Justifying grace is the grace that brings wholeness in our broken world. It's a grace that brings wholeness for us through the love of Christ. It is grace that brings wholeness to us through the resurrection of Jesus and life that we experience through the life of Christ. For some of us, justifying grace is a moment, and for many of us, it is something that we experience over and over again. The third type of grace that Wesley talked about, and this is a grace that was a little bit controversial, but I love it because a little bit of controversy is good. He talked about sanctifying grace. He called it perfecting grace. He talked about that as Christian perfection. The idea that in this life we might become like Christ. Sanctifying grace is the grace that we experience over and over as we try to be like Christ in this world. As we try to be the hands and feet that feed the poor and heal the sick, comfort the widow and the orphan as we seek to be the hands and feet that love our neighbors as Christ has loved us, as we reach out to those who normally are on the margins of our world, this is the kind of sanctifying grace that makes us like Christ. John Wesley talked about it, that it's not necessarily that we become perfect, but that we become perfected in our love for God and one another. That we have this big, audacious hope that we might just be like our brother Christ. In the Acts of John, which is a non-canonical scripture, so this is not scripture, but it's kind of interesting. In the Acts of John, based on John, the beloved disciple, if you look at a picture of the Leonardo da Vinci's picture of the Last Supper, some say that the A beloved disciple John is the one that is on the side of Jesus closest to his heart because he loved his Christ. And we're told in the Acts of John that after the Last Supper, Jesus had given the the bread and the wine and talked about his body and his blood, the love that he had for his disciples and for all the world and his pouring out of himself for us. We're told in the Acts of John that afterwards and after the Supper, there was a Hebrew circle dance. I love that idea. That after the Last Supper, the disciples got up with Jesus and they danced together. I don't know if it's true or if it happened, who knows? But if you, if you look up a Hebrew circle dance, you'll notice that, that during the dance, they circle up and sometimes someone comes in the middle to kind of separate and dance in the middle. And then sometimes in this dance, the person in the middle offers a blessing to the folks on the outside of the circle. So I want you to see that picture in your mind. You've got the disciples and they're dancing in a circle and Jesus goes to the middle. And in the Acts of John, it says that Jesus looks out to the disciples and says, the whole universe takes part in this dancing. 
We just had the Last Supper, and Jesus looks out and says, the whole universe takes part in this dancing. I'd like to suggest that quite possibly the idea of prevenient and justifying and sanctifying grace is a dance. We're not really sure where one kind of grace takes over or one experience of grace starts and where one ends. We know that grace is always in the world and the love of God is, purve- is, is out purveying and, and, and sharing. We know that the love of God is it's here and now and it's in the future, it's in the past. And it's a divine dance that the whole universe gets to take part in. I wonder how we are participating in that dance. You know, when you watch folks dance, it's hard to tell where the feet are moving and where the arms are going. It's hard to tell, you know, where the hips are moving. It's, it's, a, it's not straight line. It's not necessarily always easy to see. But when a dance is right, man, is it beautiful. I wonder in what ways we are participating in the dance of sharing God's grace in the world. I wonder in what ways we are allowing the grace of God to shape our lives, both in those very difficult days and in the days of joy, knowing that in each moment we have the opportunity to share God's love. I know that these are thoughts maybe that you've heard before. I mean, prevenient, justifying, and sanctifying grace is something that Methodists talk about all the time. But I wonder how often we allow that to shape how we live our lives. I wonder how often we take time to pause and to recognize that the air we breathe is thick with the presence of God. So one of my favorite stories when talking about grace in the whole of the Bible is the wedding of Cana. The wedding of Cana is Jesus' first miracle in the gospel of John. It is a miracle in which he is at a wedding and his mom asks him to make sure there's more wine. It's a story probably many of you remember and know. You'll remember that The story takes place on the third day of the wedding. In the Hebrew tradition, the wedding celebration would have been a week. So we're not quite halfway done on day three, and we find out that we are out of wine. The party could go south fast. People might start leaving. And Mary, being the mother that she is, recognizes this, and recognizing who her son is, she looks at Jesus and says, Son, help them out. And you remember in the story, this is really interesting. Christ says, but it's not my time yet. Y'all remember that? It's not my time. And you wonder if he's waiting for the right moment to, to help people see that he's the Christ. You wonder if he's waiting for the right moment to, to share uh, who he is and who he's becoming and who he will be through the death and resurrection. We don't really know. We just wonder this. But at the end of the day, he listens to his mama. And we're told that the stewards go get six Six vats to fill with water. And these vats, I've seen them in Canada, they're, they're huge. Like you can't even put your arms around them. They're made and they're hollowed out of stone. It would have taken probably five or six folks to carry them around. 20 to 30 gallons of fluid could be contained in these vats until they get six of them. And Jesus tells the the stewards to fill them with water and then take them to the head steward to taste it. And we're told that when he tastes the wine, it's not box wine. It's the good stuff. The Willamette Valley, it came from France. We don't know. It's the good stuff. And there's six vats completely full of this new wine. Jesus' miracle is a miracle of abundance. The grace that Christ shares with us in this world has no limit. It's day three of the wedding. And he doesn't make crummy wine. He makes the best wine. 
He doesn't serve the stuff from the bottom shelf. He serves the stuff from the top. Sorry, this might be a little bit of apologetics on tavern theology now. But Jesus did it, I'm just saying. I wonder what it would look like for us to look at this world through the lens of an abundant grace. Through the lens of a love that conquers all, is in all, is through all, and causes us to love in a way that is strange, that's abundant, that makes our neighbors ask, like, what's going on with you? Makes our coworkers say, so why do you do what you do? Paul looks at us in this passage from Philippians and says, and this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more. I invite you this week to take a moment. Find a quiet place somewhere and pause. Just pause. And when you do, allow your mind and your spirit to open up a little bit in the silence. And I pray that you will notice the abundant grace that is around you. It's that divine dance that covers the universe. And when we have that experience, when you have that experience, I pray that it might reshape how you live with your family, with your neighbors. I pray if there's some kind of brokenness that you're dealing with that you might feel some love and support. And I pray, oh God, that our love might overflow. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for your grace. It's on the house. It's an economy of abundance, of love that uh, we don't deserve or can't merit, but you give to us so freely. May we participate in that love in our lives with you and with others, knowing that you are ever with us and that you call us to this love. We pray these things in Jesus' name and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.